So my name's Paul Yock. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of uh, Biodesign and the Fogarty Institute. Uh, we're co-sponsors of this evening's session, and it's a special uh, session. Uh, maybe you noticed from the advertisement that this session is in honor of Tracy Lefteroff. Uh, some of you knew Tracy well. Uh, he was uh, an active participant in this meeting, uh, had a, uh, a tremendously significant career at PricewaterhouseCoopers where uh, he uh, uh, created many uh, mergers, high-level transactions in the medtech and pharma space, uh, passed away uh, tragically early, uh, and this uh, session is in his uh, memory. Um, I want to uh, mention to you that we're going to be uh, recording the session, so if you could please put your cell phones uh, onto silent. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Casey McGlynn and Wilson Sonsini for uh, sponsoring the session. And uh, with that, oh, I, I want to mention up front that we will have an opportunity for questions at the end. And then we'll break out to a reception. The reception is going to be outside uh, here. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to David Kasich, who will introduce our distinguished guest for tonight. Thank you, Paul. Oh, am I on here? Yeah. So, so, so. so we're delighted to uh, have Jason Field here uh, with us. I think everybody knows the name Gore. I'm not certain how many people know or really understand what Gore is doing in the world of medical devices and medical technology, and that's what we're going to spend the next 50 minutes or so talking about. So just picking up on that uh, theme, Jason, uh, Gore's roots are not in med tech per se, uh, but in broader applications. Can you give us a little history of, I know it predated your arrival at Gore, give us a little history of where Gore came from. Okay, be happy to. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here, really appreciate uh, being with this esteemed group. There's some real uh, thought leadership in the room. Um, yeah, so um, speaking of thought leadership, Bill Gore was certainly uh, one of those individuals. And um, you know, our origins were really in um, application of PTFE. And uh, you know, Bill Gore was at DuPont at the time. PTFE being? Polytetrafluoroethylene. Which is? A plastic. A plastic, okay. A, uh, <laughs> Fluorinated polymer, and um, we have a, a we have a tech person here with the least tech person possible on earth. So I may ask you to explain some of these. David, you have a veterinarian here. You do not have an engineer by your side. So uh, you know we may we may have some gaps on the uh, on the technical front, but there's some expertise in the room. But uh, you know, interestingly, um, Bill Gore had this uh, you know what I would characterize as a real vision for applying these materials to really have a meaningful impact on society. And he saw very early on a lot of different opportunities to, um, you know, to apply that polymer. And we started really in the wire and cable business. Um, he was, you know, and, and really his wife, Vive, too. It, it wasn't just Bill. I mean, they were um, absolutely a couple that came forward in a, in a very entrepreneurial way. And um, I think what really stands out about them was the breadth of capability they brought. You know, these are, they, they had kids in college. Um, Bill Gore quit DuPont. Um, Bill and Vive actually physically built their home with their own hands. And that became their first manufacturing facility where they started this wire and cable business. And from there, they just saw additional applications um, for PTFE and expanded the technology base. So we, I think we all know, even if you know, you're not in, in med tech, uh, about Gore-Tex. What, what are the qualities of PTFE? What is Gore-Tex? What are the qualities that make it a special uh, thing around which you could build a, an enormous business. So where um, where we we I wouldn't say stumbled upon where we came upon Gore-Tex was really um, when we went from PTFE to expanded PTFE. Mm -hmm. and that was an important part of our of our history, and uh, that came to pass. We um, I think it was probably in the in the mid to late '60s. Um, we decided to get into uh, plumber's tape. Plumber's tape. Plumber's tape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pipe thread tape. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I guess as the story goes, we took a big order, and uh, the cost structure was out of whack. So we were looking for ways to um, stretch the PTFE to make more with less. And uh, Bill Gore's son Bob was working on, um, you know, really trying to refine the process to um, improve that cost structure, and was working, I think, through. Um, 
you know, using different, uh, different temperatures to try to expand the PTFE and wasn't having any success developing process windows, got frustrated and yanked on a rod of PTFE and ex expanded it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the implication is it really changed the microstructure and it went from, you know, relatively solid rod of PTFE to this thing that was composed of nodes and, and fibrils with, with spaces in between. And that's what's really been, that, that was probably our first sort of, um, you know, curve jump, if you will, from a growth standpoint, where we really started to see a lot more applications for the technology by virtue of um, our ability to then start to modify the. Um, and, the and those new applications were not necessarily in the cable and wire, but were in like uh, clothing and, mater and uh, you know, materials and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the Gore-Tex you know, question in particular, um, you know, the porosity that uh, existed, you know, where those fibrils stretch between the nodes allowed us to control, um, really allow you know, um, uh, water vapor to go through, keep moisture out. And uh, that's really been foundational. That, that control of the porosity has been a really important component of our technology. So again, I know this is before you got there, and, and we'll get into how you got to Gore in just a minute. But if that's the late 60s or mid to late 60s, by the 70s, Gore, uh, Gore was in the, uh, the medical uh, device, medical applications. Um, tell us how that came about, and, and specifically yeah. how, what, what was it about PTFE that lent itself to the Gore team idea that there were medical applications there. Okay, so I can be a little more prescriptive with dates. The expansion occurred in 69. Okay. Um, on the heels of that, we started to look at, uh, you know, different, um, different forms, if you will. So, you know, fibers, um, membranes, and one of the forms that was worked on actually was, uh, was developed in Flagstaff, Arizona, it was a tube. And, um, as the story goes, uh, Bill Gore started carrying this PTF, expanded PTFE tube around with him, and he was invited to speak at a, uh, I think a cardiothoracic or um, uh, cardiac surgeon um, uh, meeting in Denver, and he had this tube with him and went skiing with a physician and said, "Hey, you know, any, you think there's any application for this as a, as a, as a graft for um, you know vascular disease?" Mm -hmm. And that led to that physician um, starting to do some in vivo in vitro work. And uh, first implant, first commercialization, I think it was in 75. Um, and that was really the origins of our, of our medical device business. So what were, the, what were those, they were vascular graphs, but, but anywhere where there was a vasculature or were they specifically around uh, certain kinds of, uh, of graphs? First one was, I believe, um, hepatic portal vein. I think that was the, the very first um, implant. And uh, you know, from there, really, the orientation has been towards um, you know, arterial repair or um, uh, hemodialysis. So um, talk about how you got to Gore, because as you said, you're a veterinarian yeah. uh, by training and by practice at that time. Uh -huh. When did you, what, what was your early interaction with Gore before joining the company? And how did, that, how did you transition into a role at the company? Yeah, so I was uh, owned and operated this large animal veterinary practice. I was um, working on sport horses primarily, and um, sport horses. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's where the money was. Yeah, <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of my clientele. Flagstaff's a pretty small community. We're about seventy thousand people, and uh, you know, twenty five hundred associates in uh, in Flagstaff. So a lot of my clientele were Gore Associates, and. Um, you know, a couple of things stood out as I started to develop relationships with them. You hear about, uh, you know, some of the exciting things that they could talk about that they were working on from an R&D standpoint. And, you know, you just sort of notice the character of these people. And, you know, I was really drawn to them. Um, you know, kind of a shared value system, um, liked being around them, liked working on their horses. And um, an opportunity arose to, you know, sell my practice, sell the real estate with it, and, uh, and go to Gore and step into an R&D role. And uh, you know it was an attractive opportunity to me as a as a veterinarian. You're sort of um, uh, inventive uh, by necessity. You know we've got pretty limited resources to try to do a lot of different things, and uh, the idea of getting into an environment where you know I'd spend time with really smart people. Um, being a veterinarian can be pretty isolated, um, particularly a horse veterinarian. So what were the early applications of the Gore technology in graphs, and was there an obvious 
veterinarian app, uh, vet, a veterinarian medicine application, or were you coming in doing human anatomy and stuff like that? Yeah, there was not a strong connect. My, like my connection from a, um, from a horse standpoint was I did try to use a Gore-Tex membrane to treat a condition called thrush that horses get in their feet where you're trying to kind of manage infection and moisture. Um, didn't work, but um, that was uh, just dabbling with the technology a little bit. When I came into Gore, I actually came in working on the bioabsorbable platform right. um, with a product called SeamGuard and spent my first uh, almost two years with that product. Bioabsorbable grafts? Um, no, it was a staple line reinforcement. Okay. Yeah, for general surgical. So uh, you start as an R&D uh, researcher there or? or? Um, role we call product specialist, probably most akin to a product manager, um, but with a little more of uh, maybe a clinical technical orientation. So where, where was the medical applications business? I, I, I'm pausing around the term device. I mean, do you can, I guess these are graphs. So they're, they're devices, device, yeah. They're the devices. Yeah. So um, where, was, where, were the med, where was the medical device business within Gore at, at that point? What was the reception of the marketplace to uh, uh, graphs based on Gore-Tex? And were, were there, you talk about a, a stapling line. Were, were there other applications that Gore was exploring at that time? Yeah, it, so I joined at an absolutely fabulous time, and there's a lot of little um, elements to this. I, you know, as we think about innovation um, that I got exposed to, that I feel really fortunate to have had the opportunity to, to engage. But I joined, as I said, in the general surgery business, which what had happened was that vascular graft business um, grew and sort of got to maturity and plateaued a little bit. And as, as that business started to plateau, this general surgery business where we were working on... Uh, ventral hernia repair, we were working on staple line reinforcement. Um, some other products was really starting to you know, drive some growth. I came in when um, we brought in complementary technology to really boost that vascular graft business. Mm -hmm. So the general surgery business was then starting to plateau and um, from a vascular graft standpoint, we'd entered, we entered into a partnership with a company called ProGraft here in the, in the Bay Area. And um, that partnership with ProGraft, where we married our graft technology with their um, know-how around uh, um, nitinol and catheters, allowed us to really um, get into um, catheter-based technologies and, and, again, was a, another big opportunity for us to, to jump a growth curve. So what, what was the adoption of the Gore graphs in the early, early on? I mean, what would you, do you have a sense of what the competition was like? What were the other materials? What were the, what were the other graphs uh, made out of? Um, for the most part, um, polyester has been our, our you know, primary source of competition. In, obviously, in um, you know, hemodialysis, it's, uh, it's native. It's, it's fistula right. first. Um, but really, polyester has been the, the main source of competition from a material standpoint. Mm -hmm. and, and what is special about, about the Gore technology that makes it a superior graph to to the uh, to polyester. I appreciate that you're giving us superiority, just like free. That's awesome. <laughs> correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I, I, I'm, I am uh, absolutely believe it. You know, it's um, it's really it, it's it's different, right? Um, you, you'll if you think back to the days of polyester and having to pre-clot, the porosity is um, quite different. With with PTFE, um, it's it's almost completely bio inert. Mm -hmm. So from an implantable standpoint. Um, it's, a, it's a great material set. And then our ability to both manipulate the microstructure and bond different constructs together to create different um, sort of properties within an implantable differentiates it. So we don't, uh, for example, our stent frame, we don't suture our stent frame to the graft. It's bonded mm -hmm. um, through a process. So where some of the early failures were, um, you know, suture hole leakage, um, you know, we didn't have, uh, we had other issues, but mm -hmm. we didn't have, uh, have those types of issues. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, from a durability standpoint, um, you know, I, I, I feel pretty confident saying that, uh, you know, our, our, our products have been pretty unmatched. Yeah, I mean, I tossed that up as a softball uh, unwittingly. Um, but I, I just meant to say, uh, why would anybody prefer uh, or use a, a, a gore vascular graft as, over, over, you know, the polyester competition? Yeah. What are the special features of it that make it... Uh, desirable or, or make surgeons want to use it? 
Yeah, it's a, you know, so a combination, if you fast forward to today, and you know, we're kind of bouncing back and forth between um, vascular graft and aortic graft. You know, one um, really managing occlusive disease, the other trying to keep the, the vessel from rupturing. So different, uh, different attributes and different applications. Um, you know, patency's been, um, you know, a real hallmark of our vascular grafts and um, our ability to uh, covalently bond heparin to our grafts in, in the recent past has improved that patency and um, really brought it to um, be pretty competitive with, uh, um, you know, with, uh, with native, uh, native tissue. Um, so just the product performance is a big piece of it. Probably as important as that is um, just our approach in general to how we think about product performance and um, sort of our bar for fitness for use. You know, I, we, being in med tech, every, you know, we all have a fitness for use mindset. We all believe our products need to, need to deliver to a certain performance criteria, and it's regulated as such. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some of the uniqueness of Gore and you know, some of what we've learned over the years is commitment to the technology and the application has allowed us to always really stay on top of uh, iterating our devices to continuously prove, improve its performance. So talk about how the, the medical device business at Gore has evolved and developed over the years. You're, you, you joined, what, what year did you join? The, uh, 2005. You joined in 2005, so you've yeah. been there almost 15 years now, four, 14 years. Yeah. Where was Gore in terms of its product breadth and range in 2005, and, and, and how different was that from those initial applications that came about in the 70s? And then we'll ask how it's evolved since 2005. Okay. Um, yeah, so in 2005, we were just really getting rolling. We were in that you know, sort of H2 phase, scaling up our, um, our interventional businesses, both aortic and peripheral. So um, we had uh, products. You were primarily a cardiovascular business at that point. We were primarily a vascular graft business at okay. that time, and uh, we had this general surgery business as well. We were really moving into, um, you know, being a little broader than that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that was the, I mean, it was an incredibly exciting time. We brought in um, capability from, uh, from Guidant in particular that really helped us kind of orient towards um, how to compete in this interventional market. So we had a, a you're talking about capability. Are you talking about people or are you talking about technology? People. Talking, talking about people. So there's the technology component of the nitinol and the catheters. Mm -hmm. um, nitinol, again, coming from ProGraft and you know, catheters to some degree. Ultimately, the acquisition of Adam Spence was, uh, was the strong catheter piece for us. When did that happen and what was that technology exactly? That was 2004, where we actually acquired Adam Spence, um, braided tubing catheters that really you know, enabled. Uh, Interventional, uh, interventional products, but the people stuff was, it was as important as the technology. Um, you know, the, we, we had a woman come in who had a real understanding of um, market and, uh, and sales and engagement, what it was going to take to really go from a you know, very small sort of mom and pop sort of operation to um, you know, an enterprise that, uh, that can compete with uh, some, of the, some of the biggest industry, industry players. So it's interesting you say that because, I mean, it, from the description uh, you're offering, it seems that this was a very uh, uh, science, materials-based mentality, and suddenly you had to think about how do we develop products for the market. What was that transition like? And particularly for you, did you have a sense of, if we have an interventional cardiology interventional vascular business, I should say, and, and we need to be bigger and we want to be bigger. How, how did Gore wrap its mind around that, that effort? I mean, you brought people in, but what was that process like? Did you have people suddenly thinking differently about what the business was? It, you know, it's easy to look back and sort of paint a rosy picture of what happened. It happened, it was fast and furious, mm -hmm. and it was all hands on deck, and we are still very much to this day a very... Um, technically oriented, um, R &D humble, R&D-driven enterprise mm -hmm. organization. But what's happened is that sort of, um, that humility, that engagement has uh, really had a positive impact on our commercial operations. It's allowed us to develop really deep relationships with um, uh, the physician community. 
which has influenced both how we go to market, but then also how we develop into markets. Um, so that's, you know, it's an evolution where we, we really, uh, I, I think, um, created an opportunity for us to expand our breath by virtue of uh, how we matured through that time. So when you and I were talking on the phone a, a while ago, you talked about some, some of the challenges that Gore faced early on in this medical business. I don't know if, it, if, if these events dated from the, you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s or, or from the period when after you arrived, but but can you talk about what some of those early challenges are? One, one around the AAA business. Yeah, you know we had uh, we had challenges in almost all of these technologies when we came to market. And I think it just it highlights how um, just the fortitude to bring these products to market and uh, the the type of leadership required that I was just like privileged to. Um, you know, be mentored by. But, uh, you know, one example, you know, I would say is uh, our thoracic uh, aortic graft. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in that, uh, in that design, we had a longitudinal spine wire on our stent frame to, to give the device column strength. And uh, that spine wire, um, we, we noticed it was fracturing in some of the, the very early implants. No clinical sequela whatsoever, but that spine wire was fracturing. And, uh, you know, it's tough when you're sitting there, you're bringing this technology to market, you see this complication, patients aren't having an issue. Um, and that decision of, you know, do you withdraw, do you stay in the market? Ultimately, we withdrew that product from the market. Um, that resulted in... Um, when did that happen? Uh, that was uh, uh, probably late 90s, early 2000s. Um, so it was coming back onto the market when I, when I joined Gore. Um, and we destroyed a lot of relationships with physicians who felt like this was a product that um, you know, was allowing them to make a difference for patients who were not eligible for surgical repair. Mm -hmm. We were acting out of an abundance of caution. We weren't comfortable with the fitness for use, the performance of our products, trying to do the right thing, and meanwhile, get sort of disconnected with the physician base that you're trying to stay close to. Ultimately, we redesigned the graft. It was another opportunity for us to apply our technology. Mm -hmm. So by um, you know, using our materials in a different way, we were able to develop and, and deliver that column strength through PTFE rather than, um, rather than the spine wire and brought it back to market. That was the time I got to join was the scale up where uh, you know, we're entering into the US market with that graft. And did physicians come back? I mean, you said they were a little shaken perhaps in their relationship with, yeah. with Gore, but did they, were you able to convince them that you'd fixed it and it, and it was time to come back? You know, by and large, yes, but um, not not entirely. Actually, you know, um, that was uh, it was a big impact, particularly in Europe. And who was your competition at that time? Um, you know, Medtronic, Cook um, were were primarily our, our our competitors. And why do you say particularly in Europe? Was there something about the physician culture in Europe that made them more leery of? Yeah. No, it was just that point in time where we were we were commercial in Europe and uh, you know in in clinical trials in the U.S. So let, let's talk a little about your ascension at at uh, at Gore. You you came in uh, in around 2005, mm -hmm. and you started the R&D. How did you progress through the through the corporation? Um, without a lot of intention, it's been, you know it was largely um, what I would characterize as uh, as chasing opportunities, I guess. Um, I still, I did and still have a really strong affinity for the technical side of things, but I, you know, I have gravitated away from it over time, um, largely by virtue of just seeing opportunity to, to make an impact. So R&D to, um, you know, when I say R&D, it's that, it's that project right. product management type thing. Um, moving into more of a general management business type capacity, which, you know, I had some of that in my veterinary practice and I, I started to miss it. And, uh, I liked the people leadership components and uh, was really drawn to it. From there, marketing, then sales. And, then and when did you become CEO? Uh, almost one year ago to the date. Wow, yeah. okay, that's great. Congratulations on that. So yeah. what were some of the challenges? What were some of the opportunities? I mean, as you, as you thought about it, is, is Gore still a very much an R&D technology-driven company? I mean, I, there are other challenges that companies face in terms of expanding their business, um, when you think yeah. about where Gore 
is today? Is it really about product line expansion, extension? Is it about developing new materials? How, how do you think about what Gore does really well? I think it's, it's yes to all of that. So what we do really well is, um, I, I think, you know, two things. One, um, our sort of commitment to each other, our commitment to our customers, how we think about, um, how we think about going to market and how we think about solving um, you know, real problems that, that make an impact um, in society, I think is something that really drives us. We are still very much a technology company, so connecting our technology to those opportunities to make an impact, that's the, that's the motor that drives Gore. Um, and at the same time, we are at this place that many companies get to where um, you know, we've got a lot of, and us in particular, we're incredibly diversified. We've got all these um, niche products where we've solved unique problems, and you know, we've got to find a way to scale. And when companies like us start trying to scale, you start you know, running the risk of really stifling that, that creative spirit, that innovative spirit. And uh, that's a lot of what we're wrestling with right now is you know, we're having an immune reaction you know, to a large degree as an enterprise to trying to drive some of the process discipline that's required to automate, if you will. So I was gonna save this question for later, but let me ask it now since you've, since you've, you've taken us to, uh, in this direction. And I wonder why scale is important to you in the context of a medical device industry that has seen tremendous consolidation over the co course of the last five years. Um, uh, you know, particularly in the cardiovascular side of things, and even, frankly, in general surgery, you know, we've gone from a very, very, you know, diverse competitive landscape to one where really, you know, you could count on one hand the companies with significant market share in the space. How does a company like, what does scale mean to a company like Gore? And how does Gore compete in that kind of environment? Yeah, so it's a, I mean, it's a complicated question for us because at the end, we are, we are not just a medical device company at the end of the day. We are a technology-driven company that has, you know, we're looking for opportunities to make an impact um, through our material capabilities. And it just so happens that um, healthcare has been one of those applications that's been really meaningful to us. Um, you know, we have made a conscious decision. There's no way we're going to scale and compete with, um, with Medtronic. It's just not what we do. It's not what we're good at. It's not in our core. Um, we, we will continue to look for opportunities to develop products that really make a meaningful impact, that we can stand behind. We understand the application, and it ties to our competencies. That's, our, that's what we do. Um, when I talk about scale and some of our challenges, it really speaks to, you know, we've got our, our fabrics division, our medical products division, we've got many different industries we operate in within our performance solutions division, and you start thinking about, um, you know, just within, simple within things. Within WL Gore, with it, broadly speaking. Within the enterprise broadly. You start thinking about simple things like IT applications or marketing capability. That stuff is really expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you start replicating that capability um, 20, 30, 40 times for each individual business, the cost structure gets out of control. So we've got to find ways to create some synergies across those businesses and really enable um, this sort of distributed decision making that has been key to um, you know, our innovative spirit. Back off the side, where, where are the synergies with businesses that are much more industrial or, or, or you know, consumer-oriented in their, in their focus? I mean, do you basically operate as a, as a, as a medical device silo, or, or are there resources within Gore that you can draw on? We have largely, um, up until recently, operated as a, as a medical device silo um, to a large degree. The... The exception and the, the common thread or the red thread that cuts through everything is our technology base. So we have a core technology unit that really feeds all of the divisions. And that's the, um, that's the piece that's always been um, the connector, if you will, across the divisions. We're now, though, starting to look at, you know, if you think of our, our ERP system and our financial reporting, um, you know, you can't spend $100 million, you know, 10 times on an ERP system. Um, you know, you've got to find ways to do these that uh, these programs that cut across the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So, give us a sense of how the medical device business of Gore is structured today. How many different markets, and, and when I say markets, d defined either in terms of call points or or technologies or product lines, do you play in, and, and how 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 is the organization structured? 
we've, it, you know, it's pretty straightforward. We are, we're a pretty focused, um, pretty focused group. We've got this general medical products business that's pretty mature. And what is that, what, what is include, what devices are included in that business? Um, so it's largely um, ventral hernia repair, um, minimally, minimally invasive hernia repair, some wound care stuff, staple line reinforcement is, is that business. Um, our vascular business has been really our growth engine, um, consists of our uh, peripheral interventional products and our aortic products. And then we have a uh, developing cardiac business around structural heart. So those are our, our three main um, businesses. And what product lines are in the structure, structural heart business? So the, uh, our septal occluders are our um, primary products. So um, Gore Septal Occluder, not a very uh, catchy marketing name, but Gore Septal Occluder is the, uh, is the uh, foundation of that business. And um, we've uh, just expanded indication for that, uh, for that product to address PFO stroke, which mm -hmm. has been a real, um, put us on a real growth trajectory there. So that's been pretty exciting. So how do you think about where Gore goes next in terms of, it feels to me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, be glad to, that there's a lot of niches in which product areas where there could be expansion in other areas, or you could go into wholly different uh, clinical spaces. I mean, we, we didn't mention uh, women's health or orthopedics or, or, or lots of other different areas. When you th without getting into things that are proprietary or, or might... Uh, Reveal stuff that you're not don't really want to talk about. How, how do you think about where you're going to grow next? I mean, is is again in this in this world in which we're seeing tremendous consolidation and economic buyers kind of wanting to work with fewer and fewer vendors? How does a company that is built on uh, niches, valuable niches, but niche technologies? How how do you how do you think about where you're going, where you're going to go next? So we we are pretty clear that in order for us to compete. Um, you know, with a smaller portfolio of products, we have to have meaningful differentiation. We have to have value creation for um, all of our stakeholders. So that's at the that's at the core of our um, of our strategy. We're generally looking in two different areas. One within the markets we serve today. How do we um, maybe get after some portfolio breadth that would be complementary from either a portfolio standpoint, a service standpoint, or a technology-based standpoint? So looking for opportunities to really take advantage of, um, of the market access we've earned um, with, our, with our existing portfolio. We also have um, you know, a really strong incubator both within medical and outside of medical, looking for opportunities to push technology into um, new healthcare markets. Is that incubator located in the medical device business, or is it in Gore overall? And how do you how do you get them if it's if it's the the latter within the larger Gore structure? How do you get them to, to kind of focus on the medical applications? So we have uh, actually two distinct incubators. Um, you know, and this has been a really important lesson for us. If if we're going to grow, we have um, you know really been students a lot of the of a lot of the. Uh, um, key influencers, many of which um, you know residing in this area, but we have absolutely uh, taken to heart that we have to isolate um, dollars and people in order to really incubate new ideas. So we have an incubator within the medical products division that operates within a set of guardrails um, in terms of market, and then we have um, an incubator that's uh, more broadly within our enterprise that has actually a few different components to it. It's not just organic pulling on our technology. Um, we've got the uh, Silicon Valley Innovation Center here that's really focused on partnerships. Um, we've got a small group working on venture engagement where you know that's less about um, investment and more about exposure to technology. And then we've got uh, another group looking at, uh, at BD. So, uh, so those are all kind of great questions. And you know, we're here in the center of, of small startup technology. How much of the new technology that is, is coming out of Gore now will come out of Gore in the future will be driven by internal R&D? And how much will come about either through investment in small companies or acquisition of small companies? We mentioned the um, Adams Benz, Benz uh, deal, which was decades ago. Uh, uh, is Gore an active acquirer these days, or, or how does it look at? How do you look at the landscape of, of innovative startups that that are out there and, and could possibly contribute to Gore's portfolio? 
Um, you know, we have been fortunate to be, you know, we've been on this incredible growth journey and it's all, almost all been driven by, um, you know, organic development. You know, we've had this complementary technologies come in that have been catalysts to growth, but a lot of this has been organically driven. I think we are getting to a point though where we recognize um, the breadth of technology that needs to come together to solve a lot of the, the issues that we see out there. Um, we're not gonna be able to develop all those capabilities internally. So uh, partnerships and acquisitions will become increasingly important to us. Um, we don't have a depth of capability in acquisition. We've done a handful here and there. Um, you know, we've got some equity investments, but it's, it's not necessarily a core competency for Gore. Our core competency is pushing our technology into new applications. So we'll continue to emphasize that, but we'll be looking for ways to augment our, uh, our offerings. When you and I spoke, you, you uh, made a point several times of talking about the kind of special culture of, in a very, very innovation-driven, very passionate culture uh, of Gore. And I wonder, uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. I know it was one of the things that attracted you to Gore in the first place. Yeah. But do you think that culture presents challenges or obstacles when you then look outside uh, for technology that, is, that doesn't come out of Gore itself? Yeah, I mean, my, my, I think all of our cultures present their own, their own challenges. Um, you know, we're, we're fortunate, our, our culture is so deeply, you know, we're six decades, uh, you know, into this thing. And some of the core tenets of our culture have, uh, you know, were really put in place at the very beginning. Um, you know, we've got a handful of principles that really um, create sort of a social construct that we operate within. And, uh, it, it contributes to a very, um, really a very innovative culture and um, a culture where distributed decision making um, is, you know, predominant when things are working well. But again, you get back to the scale thing and, you know, you overlay regulatory, you overlay compliance, you overlay all of these requirements that, uh, you know, sort of evolved over the years since this culture was um, really envisioned by Bill and Vive Gore. And you get layers of leadership that get in the way of some of the some of the magic that is, uh, you know, help get us to where we are today. So that's that's some of our biggest challenges. How do we, you know, foster this innovative spirit? Um, sort of that uh, that uh, individual engagement, individual commitment, sense of responsibility, willingness to take risk. When um, you know you also have internal controls that try to keep things in check. That's big challenge for us. So when you think about a medical device business that at its roots in the 70s grew out of the PTFE uh, technology, does your future uh, product line expansion, business line expansion rest on PTFE? Does it, will you be looking uh, for other uh, kinds of technology bases from which to go in order to fill market gaps? Or, or how, how critical is that kind of core gore technology, there may be other core gore technologies that, that you can fill us in on. How, co how important are those core technologies to your future expansion, as opposed to say, for instance, using uh, the incubator and the business development function to look outside of what has been gore's kind of technology sweet spot? It, you know, it'll be a combination of both. Um, I would characterize our core, core technology as much broader than PTFE today. It's really around material science. And a lot of our opportunity, I mean, we, we're still finding ways to process polymers that allow us to do things that, uh, you know, we wouldn't even conceive of even three, four years ago. Um, so it's, you know, it's really exciting to see that we've still got a lot of uh, gas in the tank in terms of, you know, what we do really well. We are also absolutely act actively looking for ways to, you know, broaden that base of technology. Okay, that's great. So, um, uh, and might that come in other clinical areas, or are, again, are there gaps within the kind of core vascular business that and general surgery business that you that you'll be focusing on going forward? Yeah. Um, you will absolutely see, you know, uh, some expansion in a very focused way. Um, and, you know, maybe it's important to note that, you know, as we think about healthcare, we also have a um, uh, set of businesses scaling up in biopharmaceutical applications, um, you know, really meant to um, support uh, drug delivery in many different ways. 
um, or uh, biopharmaceutical processing. So healthcare for us is much broader, again, tying back to our material capabilities. And there's a lot of room between you know, cardiovascular or general surgery and, uh, and biopharma and what we can do with materials to really enable solutions. So that's interesting. I mean, are, are these drug delivery technologies or, um, because I would think that, again, if you're talking about new opportunities and challenges, particularly for a company that, that you know, has been more focused on specific materials niches, that a, a seg into, segue into, um, into biopharma must be enormously challenging just because it, biopharma is such a different industry and development time frames and, and you know, just kind of technical challenges than, than medical devices. How, how would you think about a, a biopharma business? And again, if we, we talk about scale, biopharma is on a just completely different scale than... Yeah, and, and you know, quite frankly, it's totally isolated from our medical business at this point in time. Is um, it located in Flagstaff? It's not. It's located in Newark, Delaware. We do leverage some of our capability that we have in Arizona that's really grown up in the med tech space. But even with that, you know, to your point, um, there are some distinct differences, and uh, you know, we'll incubate that diff that business in uh, in different ways. Is it, is it a drug delivery application specifically, or are you looking for novel compounds that novel therapeutic compounds? So there's a variety of products. I mean, it's everything from you know, and some of them aren't aren't quite to market yet. But uh, you know, everything from um, you know stoppers for syringes, for glass syringes that, uh, you know, for, for drug delivery and that type of application to storage, um, to filtration for biopharmaceutical processing. So there's a, there's a pretty broad portfolio. Again, the, the red thread that cuts through all of them is, uh, you know, our ability to um, manipulate polymers to, uh, to create unique solutions for those. Wait, we're going we're gonna to open this up to, to questions in, in just a minute, but I wonder if then you seem to be talking about Gore as being at a kind of inflection point. It's growing nicely. There's tremendous opportunities going forward, again, without getting proprietary in terms of specific technologies. How, how are you thinking about the future of, of Gore and, and, and where, it, where it's going? Again, within the context of a medical device industry that seems to be prizing scale on a significant level or, or at least consolidation on a significant scale? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's hard to answer, um, you know, because a lot of this stuff isn't quite, uh, you know, quite or, or, you know, fully disclosed at this point in time, but we see a lot of opportunity. Um, yeah, and, and I want to be respectful of, yeah. of that, you, that you don't, yeah. you know, say stuff that you don't want to say, but, yeah. but generally speaking, you know, when you think about going forward. Yeah, I mean, our, um, I appreciate the continued push. I mean, our, our interest is, uh, <laughs> is um, you know, we really see ourselves as having a unique ability to um, play in the cardiovascular space in particular. And there are um, some other opportunities, again, that will probably require more partnership um, where we marry up our technology with, uh, with other capabilities to, to expand the space of business. You we say see partnerships within other GORE capabilities or with, with outside? Outside. outside. Yeah, outside. Well, well, great. I think it's a fascinating picture of a company that, <laughs> again, uh, I, I at least was not as familiar. We're going to open the, field, the floor up for questions right now, and I think there's a micro, and if there's not, uh, just shout your question. But while we're waiting for one, let, let me uh, just go back to one. I wonder if you can elaborate on the incubator structure because um, uh, we tend to think about incubators as... Um, as extra, you know, as, as as you know, outside of the context of large established companies, but there have been a couple that have, have done very well. Edwards uh, has had has uh, an incubator. Just just again, go back over what those incubator functions are like at Gore. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's still early days for us. Um, you know, to a large degree, we're following sort of the you know the lean startup methodology. Um, it's working really well, I think, um, for actually the, the non-healthcare applications where you know, R&D cycle times are faster and there's less regulation. Um, and we're also having some success on the healthcare side, but you know, it's just the, the, the principles that are talked about here in, uh, in the Valley quite a lot of isolating the resources, committing the resources, not letting it compete with, uh, with the commercial businesses. Um, making sure that we're bringing together different disciplines, connecting sales with our, with our technical community, getting them out of the building, 
um, and uh, you know really force the uh, you know, work in the business model canvas. And it's actually been pretty productive. We're developing some good process discipline, but we've got a long um, a long way to go. The other thing I would highlight again and just reinforce is it's it's not only the organic piece. It's this the role that uh, the Silicon Valley Innovation Center is playing in testing partnerships. We're making some micro equity investments to you know develop relationships and support startups. So um, it's a it's a, it's a new thing for us to be looking um, externally as proactively as we have been in the last uh, probably 18 to 24 months. And are those investments that you're making within the Silicon Valley uh, entity all strategically driven or are they, or are they more kind of white, white paper kind of let, let's look at areas that we don't know that we're in right now but, but could possibly want to be in? Yeah, it's a, a little bit of both. I mean, it's... Um, you know, a lot of our emphasis is on digital healthcare. Um, you know, really? in the valley, and you know, trying to grow a capability there. If it's a material science company, um, that's not our, uh, you know, our, our our basic capability. So we're trying to complement some of what we do with uh, um, a lot of the capability that exists. So everybody, I mean, digital is such an important and such a hot topic today. Um, but I, I wouldn't think of, about. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around what kind of digital. Again, I don't want. to... Uh, I I'll bring you over to <laughs> reveal corporate secrets here, but I'm trying to figure out what would be a digital player for a company like Gore. I mean, just simple example, um, you know, if you think in terms of uh, wearables or patches, um, using our, you know, porous materials, um, managing microfluidics to get to flexible circuitry to, you know, help. Uh, you know, one example we're working with a company on. Um, uh, detecting um, electrolytes and sweat to understand, um, you know, with temperature to understand the impact on industrial workers, for, you know, in terms of are they getting overworked and how do we manage their overall health and effectiveness. So just one example. Great. Are there any questions from anybody in the audience? Anybody? Have a question, Jason? Here's one in the, in the uh, third row here. Yeah, if I may, if I may say so, I, I consider uh, aortic replacement one of the more high-risk implants uh, how, how do you manage risk during development with such products? Um, that was a little bit of what I was alluding to earlier. I mean, it's um, you manage risk with um, courageous leadership and um, you know a, a sense of conservatism and always doing the right things for the patients. Um, I think that's what it comes down to at the end of the day is the is the leaders and how they step in the room. Um, you know, w when you're faced with the issues that uh, that inevitably arise, and, and we've stepped through many of them over the years. Um, one advantage, I, I don't know if it's an advantage, but one thing that has, um, I think, been at the core of our ability to um, manage the risks through the years is, you know, we are um, privately held and family owned and have very little pressure from an economic standpoint when it comes to doing the right thing. I mean, we step in a room and it is, uh, Everybody's oriented to impact of patients and what's the right thing to do, and that's the conversation every single time, and that's the core of our risk mitigation. And then from there, you get into more of the formalities of, um, you know, utilizing the processes that uh, that we put in place to make sure we're managing risk. But it starts with um, associates and leadership that are that are committed to do the right thing. And I would think that part of managing risk, uh, correct me if you if you disagree, is the willingness to look at it novel project and novel area and and be comfortable with not succeeding in that in that area and because it feels to me like a lot of what gore has a lot of its internal growth has come through kind of incremental steps building on existing technologies and exist, existing businesses and it seems to me that when you when you go outside to 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 do that the risk just rat, ratchets up enormously it does and um I, you know we have a we do have a risk-oriented culture when, it, when it's working well. And if you look at um, you know, our, our most significant innovations, you know, more broadly than just, than just med tech, um, they have come through incredible personal risk and enterprise risk to, to, to really get where we are today. Um, Goes back to Bill Gore's original decision to leave DuPont to set up Gore, to build yeah, Gore. Absolutely. Um, I think that the distinction I would make is it's not a, um, you know, it's not necessarily a culture that tolerates failure. It's a culture that tolerates learning. Um, and that's the, that's the piece that's really important. You know, we're willing to take a risk and fail, 
but you darn well better be on and up to that failure and learning from it. That's actually a very nice distinction. Any other questions from folks in the audience? There's one there and there, but you've got the microphone, so why don't you go first? Yeah. Um, so at what stage do uh, you typically engage with small companies or startups? And is that is that often Gore approaching other companies or vice versa? Could you give us a flavor of how that works? Are you receptive to, uh, you know, so I mean, pitches from... Small companies? Absolutely. Um, Line up here. <laughs> our, uh, you know, just by virtue of our size, you know, we're, we're, we're not a Boston Scientific, we're not a J&J &J Medtronic. Um, you know, we have a really strong bias to early tech. Um, you know, we generally can't afford or at least haven't uh, um, made, you know, the four, five, seven hundred million dollar investments or into the billion dollar investments. It's just not... Um, sort of within our, you know, the bounds of our, our growth strategy at this point in time. So we like to invest early. We like to invest in technology, and we like to invest in technology that's complementary to, um, you know, the, the the competencies that we have in our uh, in our enterprise. And we're absolutely open to solicitation, and we we engage, as I said, through um, venture relationships, and then also through the innovation center. The other thing I would say is we, you know, we have a lab and we're working to open this lab to startups to try to um, invite and engage um, you know, early startups who don't quite have the, uh, the capital to keep things going to um, you know, participate in our environment, perhaps get a little bit of mentorship and utilize some of our equipment um, you know, in exchange for um, you know, teaching each other and, uh, and building relationships. And you're looking at for, for potential partnerships or investments with with uh, companies that have a strategic fit, but how much of that is around materials and how much of that is simply around kind of new market opportunities? It's, it's both. both. Yep. Over here. Certain, certainly seems to be advantages to being a privately held company and avoiding the public scrutiny. Do you think, though, that being a private company will prove to be a challenge with your acquisition strategy? Um. You know, it, it could if we, I, I think if we were to be really competing later stage, um, you know, with, uh, with, mature, with mature products trying to really augment our portfolio, we might have some challenges competing, but maybe not. We haven't tested that. And I think, um, you know, our experience to date would suggest that uh, um, a lot of targets are actually pretty attracted to... Um, to Gore as a company, and I think a lot of that has to do with our privately held nature and just how we operate. Mm -hmm. Let me just fill in one piece on the previous question. You mentioned not only the incubators, but that you have a business development mm -hmm. person. What's the best path into Gore? If I if I have a, a really something I think is really interesting and might fit in the Gore's Gore's portfolio, where where might I where might I go in the company to to test the interest on your part? Um, our Silicon Valley Innovation Center is a great port of entry. Um, okay. You know, we're here in Santa Clara, and uh, that's a conduit into not only um, med tech but all of our uh, all of our industries. Excellent. Here's another question right here. Two other questions. We'll go there yeah. and there. Just briefly, when you look at licensing all the technology and selling materials to other med tech companies, how does that compare to your own portfolio? Can we just repeat that? that re okay, repeat yeah. that question because. Why don't you grab the microphone because it's being taped. Thank you. So as a materials company, um, I would guess there are plenty of opportunities to license technology to other enabling or as an enabling technology to other companies. So how do you think about selling and licensing materials for MedTech versus your own product line? Well, you know, we have at uh, different points in time had um, OEM businesses to, to, to license out materials or uh, be a supplier. We've really moved away from that. Um, just by virtue of focus and some of the opportunities we've had in front of us to, you know, where we're, um, you know, fully vertically integrated, that's where the big opportunity has been. And we just haven't had the resources and bandwidth to um, continue to engage in OEM in that capacity. So we'd entertain it in the future. And there could be business models and partnerships that uh, might be more attractive than they have been in the past. Um, but in terms of the, the OEMs we've operated in, um, we've kind of moved away from most of them. We've got a couple that are ongoing, but, uh, but not too many. I think you have one more question over here. Yeah, so we, we hear a lot in the Valley that people don't invest in tech, but teams. And I think it's well known that Gore seems to have, seems to have disrupted the hierarchy of teams. So 
what is it about the way you guys structure your teams that draws talent such as yourself and lends itself to innovation and you know the synergy that uh, seems to come out of the company? Um, so a big part of it is what you tend not to experience in Gores is really heavy-handed leadership. There's an awful lot of autonomy, a lot, awful lot of freedom. You get enough rope to hang yourself very early in, uh, in your career, and you've got to manage that. And to be successful in Gore, um, you've also kind of ha you got to have a little bit of self-awareness so you don't overstep and uh, you know take too big of a risk and um, you know kind of sink the ship, if you will. <laughs> But I think what's really attractive people is that opportunity to really um, express their creative energy and make an impact both within the, within the enterprise and then also more broadly in society. I mean, this orientation we have to connecting materials to societal impact, it's a big draw for people. Um, you know, it's much bigger than the dollars. It's about, uh, it's about walking outside and seeing our products. And like, you can hardly um, go through a day without engaging a Gore product. It's in, it's, incredibly powerful to be part of this enterprise and uh, see the impact we have through our different industries that we operate in. That's a big part of the draw for me. Great. Do we have any other questions? So I was going to ask one other question, which is that when you and I talked on the phone, you mentioned that one of the things about you're very, very R&D oriented and there weren't a lot of technologies developed for uh, when you were a veterinarian, there weren't a lot of technologies developed for veterinarians. Isn't veterinarian a medicine a, a logical place for Gore to go next? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay, great. Well, Jason, thank you very much. We very much appreciate your coming out and sharing uh, your thoughts with us about Gore. And uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, there's a reception that I think will be held uh, right out to our left on, on the balcony. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Appreciate it.